Hi guys, welcome back to the Purposeful Wisdom Podcast. My name is Dawn Christine. Thank you guys so much for being here. Don't forget to hit that little subscribe button down below. Subscribe to my channel. Help me grow this channel. This gr this channel is all about healing and growth. And I give you guys the best of the best. And I have the privilege of having on today's show, Catherine Jansen Burkett. Catherine is an MPH LPC, and she received her master's in public health from University of Washington in 1992 and spent over a decade in public health managing violence prevention and teen health programs. But over time, she experienced an inner stirring. What ensued was a process of reflection, curiosity, and ultimately trust as she dove into her current career as a licensed professional counselor. Following in the footsteps of her father, who was also a therapist, she graduated in 2004 from Lewis and Clark College and has now enjoyed over 17 years in private practice, offering not only holistic psychotherapy, but retreats and workshops as well. Last year, Catherine published her first book, River to Ocean, Living in the Flow of Wakefulness. Her book reflects the human voyage of finding your way to an awakened self. As with a river that traverses steep mountains and winding valleys, our inner and outer worlds can be encumbered by a lack of connection to ourselves, old beliefs, an anxious mind, preoccupation with death, or compromised relationships to others. Each and all of these can interfere with living our most authentic and loving life. In River to Ocean, Catherine explores nine aspects of wakefulness, offering insights, practices, and her own and others' inspirational stories from the field. Hi, Catherine. Welcome to the thank show. Thank you, you so much for being here. Thank you I'm for seeing all that. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. This is so cool because I love when we get to talk about this stuff. Just, just being awake, being in the now, being in the moment. And I often feel like not a lot of us are in that stage of life. We're so occupied by the noise of what I call the noise in the outside world that we let stuff like that get in too much and it occupies our mind. It occupies our mindset. We're in a constant state of fear. And, you know, I always like to start out with what brought you to this field? What made you want to go into this field to help others become awake? That's such a great question. Thank you, Don. Um, you know, in a way, if you just how all the dots connect upon reflecting upon one's life, you know, it's like, oh, and that put me there. And then this needed to happen. And so I had um, a wonderful childhood, but had some trauma in my childhood. So at 16, um, after an eating disorder, had food addiction, had kind of, um, I was obese at that point. Um, and just mainly that was a function of just internalized pain from, um, from some trauma, um, a, a divorce that was not handled well by my father, actually, even though he was a therapist. Um, and there's more to that if you want to know, but anyway, I, I just got really dark for me. And so I actually attempted suicide and quit high school and went to San Francisco, left the small town in Oregon. And my book and even my work now as a therapist has really been all connected to a journey of healing and becoming whole or reinstating, I would say, the wholeness that I was born with. And so, um, but I, I wasn't thinking to be a therapist. I really was really interested. Once I got physically healthy, I was really interested in physical health, not so much being a like a fitness teacher or a health coach, but more going into the field, community health and public health. But I was at a personal retreat in uh, when I was 39 years old and they said, do you have a dream? And then I got this flirt, you're supposed to be a therapist. And I already had a master's degree and it was like, my life was really sad. And it was like, this is really inconvenient. <laughs> Um, so it was very much trusting because going back to school while my, some of my kids were still in school and then I have been in a private practice. I'd never owned a business by myself, but being on this side now of the process, not just as a client, but now helping people heal as a therapist is an incredible, um, part of now my, my journey and, and an incredible honor to, um, to be able to do this work. I love that answer. And, you know, it's very true that our first clients are, are ourselves. 
yeah. you know, in a way from, from learning through the trials and tribulations that life throws at us, how we handle those trials and tribulations, what we choose to let go of, what we choose to let in to make, you know, allow new growth to happen. And it's oftentimes, and I could definitely admit this, I was my first client before I even got onto the bandwagon of helping others. I was my first client. Yeah. And until I figured out what worked best for me, and I'm not saying that everything that I would do would work for others, but the the bones of it, you know, the mindset, the the moving forward, the breaking chains, the breaking the chains from certain things that hold us back, toxic relationships, toxic love, all those things are intertwined. Yeah. And once I figured that out, then I was like, okay, I'm in this space now that now I can be of service, just like you, to others to help them see that there is a light, that there is light and darkness. And, you know, I love that you shared that personal story with me because it's just, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful how you came out on the other end when at one point in your life, you were suicidal. And now to yeah. to look back to see how far you've come in this journey and the clients that you've been able to help. It's just, it's so beautiful. Just a whole full circle. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I like to mention the high school dropout part and the suicide attempt because if somebody met me now, they would not know that. They would not know I uh, really struggled and with food addiction and was 200 pounds at one point. And, you know, I, I, it's a, it's a bridge to people who don't have as much hope. And um, that's ultimately, of course, what pain is, is when you lose your way, you're either profoundly alone and, or you have no more hope. And so that's, um, I'm proud of my accomplishments, but I also, all of it, you know, had a seat at the table in terms of how, how I find myself here. And, and I find as a therapist that, you know, people were well-intended, but my work, and I think you and I share this, is about really helping people understand, why would I choose a toxic relationship? Well, probably because I have a core belief about myself, probably based in some kind of trauma or circumstance that is fraught. So then my life, which is horribly miserable, actually does match my belief system. So until we heal our belief system, until we process the emotional pain that our bodies carry, uh, we're just in some version of patterning and conditioning. And so it's nice to, um, you know, be able to share, you probably do this too, through this pod podcast, just helping people understand themselves, bringing self-awareness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I sure do. That's the goal. That is the ultimate mm -hmm. goal is just to, to give, you know, my audience the tools from all aspects of life, because I, you know, my goal is to meet people where they are. And even though it may not be with me personally, it might be with you. It might be some of my other guests that they're like, Ooh, okay. You know what? This person can help me with this. And they get to create their own building team, their own healing team. And you know, I only wish I had that when I was going through this healing process. And now that I'm in a space where I have a platform and I can give back to others and help others advertise what they do as well, that's that's the ultimate goal of this is just to, you know, have great content every week, provide as much as I can to my listeners, because it is still healing me, like in the process of getting to learn from yourself, from others that come on. And I put tools in my toolbox to keep me grounded. So, you know, I thank you for taking the time to share your insights with not only me, but my audience, because it means so much. Well, I'm happy to do so. And, you know, there's lots of areas to go into. My book was the idea that we have this you know, I call it an awakened self. We can call it our self at best. We can call it our, our consciousness, spiritual. Otherwise, the words don't really matter. It's, it's really our true self. And that if we don't do this work, it is pretty hard, especially these days. Life on the planet right now is tough to be able to navigate that much less personal kinds of things and our health things or just aging things. One of my chapters is about embracing death and dying. That doesn't mean today. I mean, I don't want to die, but I'll be ready to die because I've embraced it, you know, just but how do you contend with life on its terms and, and still show up as, as your most conscious self? So 
Yeah. And um, I I like the idea that, you know, people have a team and maybe it's coaching, maybe li- listen to a podcast, maybe they do clinical work, maybe they do retreats, like all the different versions. We're kind of ready, I believe, in the serendipitous nature of, of things. And so, you know, when we're ready, the teacher does kind of appear in whatever form that teaching is. So, yeah, I yeah, love I that. Yeah. I would love for you to explain to my audience the nine aspects of wakefulness, because I know you mentioned that in your book, that you have nine aspects of wakefulness. What are they? Well, I kind of, and it mirrors my own journey. So I felt like I believe, I knew intuitively myself, but also propose this now as a therapist, change comes from the inside out. So I started with basically you have to have a relationship with yourself. So the first aspect is befriending you. And for many people, they have a non-existent relationship with themselves or a negative one, a pretty critical one. So I go in that chapter into like the core beliefs and intrinsic worth and belonging and undoing ideas of self-love as narcissism or, or self I have a piece in there about the ego because, you know, people get confused. We have to have an ego developmentally uh, until we can kind of move beyond that state. And then I just go into those initial internal places, mindfulness. But the second one is actually freedom from the mind because our minds are so powerful that we are pretty much beholden to thought until we, unless you meditate, until you have freedom from thought, thoughts happening. We can't really control our thought and they're very conditioned, but they own us. Um, and, and that's where our actual suffering can be. So it felt like relationship to self. And then right away, how are we dealing with our head? Were the sequential places and then mindfulness, cherishing the body and um, embracing death and dying. So just kind of like, what is my own inner world kind of, what am I facing? And how am I working with parts of myself? Then outer world is actually about nature, one, because I do believe we've lost touch, that we are part of the natural world. And I actually think that's the crisis, part of the crisis happening at the individual level, not just the collective level, but moving on into developing your own spirituality, conscious relationship. That's probably my my biggest chapter because I do do a lot of couples work and dyad work and again you know I'm a kid of a divorce like I didn't I just thought you fell in love I I it's like you you need tools you need to what do you mean communicate you know I express how I feel no that shut my partner down because I was expressing it with a temper and I didn't get that part so you know th- those practices um so in my work I do a little left brain stuff because people kind of like the structure even though it also is about connecting and emotion and right brain int- intuition and right. such um and then I I've kind of finished with kind of making your way in, in a troubled world which was interesting my book actually um I published in 2019 so it was pre-pandemic that was somewhat in the politics going on in the U.S. But boy, that's what I talk about in the room now. You know, when I went to Lewis and Clark, it was anxiety, depression, relationship issues. And now it's climate crisis, you know, geopolitical realities. What's going on this week in Israel? Just heartbreaking. So pandemic, yes. you know, yes. mental health stuff around the pandemic and recovering from the pandemic. So yeah so that's the those are the nine aspects just kind of navigating inner world and then outer world i agree with that too i agree with all those topics and you're right even about you know the pre and post pandemic because you know that and that itself was traumatic for a lot of people whether or not you believe in the politics of it i'm not here to talk about politics i'm talking about the actual event itself everyone was secluded everyone had nothing but time on their hands. And there were two ways that you can go about that. You either had the time to really go within and really look at your life and look, am I happy? What am I not happy about? Like really do the inner work and actually utilize the pandemic to awaken, so to speak, or it sets you back the opposite way where you hated being alone. It, it was driving you crazy. You had no interaction with everybody. And in some aspects, yes, of course, family and friends, people you love and cherish and care about, you, you were separated for those. So that in itself was hard of being alone 
and not being with others and socializing. We're social creatures by nature. Exactly. And you had a choice of how you were going to direct and even handle yeah. the pandemic. Exactly. Well, and the, you know, it was interesting early on in Oregon, we had this idea, flatten the curve. So it was going to just be two weeks, which is so right. kind of hysterical now that we all look back. But, but this idea introverts initially were like, I love this. This is right. great. I'm home. I have my people. I don't have the stress of being out there. But boy, over time, Don, everybody um, I think the wake up call is even a smile at a stranger in a grocery store is connection. And we are social creatures and we need to belong to the whole and the kind of othering and isolation and people are fighting their way back. They're coming back into, wow, I'm anxious in a way I wasn't before when I hang out with my friends never had been identified as somebody with social anxiety. Mm -hmm. So it, it did a number on folks and, and in some ways was, you know, transformative, you know, hard sometimes, but good. But for other people, they're still, I think, on that journey. And I actually wouldn't be doing telehealth if it weren't for COVID. So, you know, I wish the pandemic hadn't happened, but there were some good things that came out of it. Um, and I think we're still in a, a process where 10 years from now, we'll look back and even have more clarity. Yeah. I agree with that statement 100%. I think this was the wake up call for a lot of people to really go within, like I said, and just really analyze their lives and really, you know, because you, you learn two things, I feel in, in, you know, on a surface level, you either could really get along with the people you were stuck with for the two okay. years where you were like, you caved in our homes or wherever the heck we, are, we ended up or you realize oh my god I can't be with this person right. anymore yeah. I can't do this anymore and it was just such it is it was a wakeful it was a wake-up call for so many people and I looked at this because I always I'm so optimistic and I always like to look at the bright side of things I always like to find the light in any kind of dark situation that's just how I am that's how I've always been and for the most part you know, in a, in a weird sort of way, the pen, you know, all these high profile CEOs, presidents of companies and stuff that maybe didn't see their kids often that were always traveling that they actually had the time. And I have many CEO friends that told me this upfront. They were like, I started to realize what was truly important in my life. I, know. I got to spend time with my kids. I started to really prioritize my life and really think about, was it so important working 80 hours a week and never seeing my children? Exactly. But now that I have my children that I was forced into this situation, so to speak, wow, I'm starting to appreciate the things that I've missed out on for sometimes years. Well, exactly. And, it, you know, for some of those people, they had to really grow a threshold, very much like loving their children, but like, I'm not used to this much time. And then for many people, they were doing an educational piece, like, oh, mm -hmm. I was not going to homeschool. All of a sudden I'm mom and then I'm teacher. And then I'm oh. like, that was hard. Right. right. And so I was processing with a lot of parents just really, you know, my belief is emotions are never dangerous. Um, right. We can have very complicated emotions and be deeply good people. And so it's just important to keep it honest. Otherwise, we're repressing those resentments or those difficulties. And that's going to come back and haunt us that that becomes problematic and consequential later. So it's just okay to say this is hard. I don't like this. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but but g having them also getting through it. And like you say, really recalibrating what was important. And um, even the consumption of like, because you couldn't, and we kind of have made up for it in the US, which is a little saddening that we didn't kind of go, wow, less is more. Like, no, less was less. No, I want more to some extent. But for, 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 I guess it's like one of those things, Don, it served all the things it needed to serve as those things in life do. But it's a one thing that people don't think about. So, you know, when you're in trauma, which is helplessness and danger combined, especially if you feel alone, it's a form of little t trauma. You know, who are you going to get mad at with a pandemic? If you take the politics out of it, of like, where did it start? Like, but helping people understand they were angry 
at, right. at a disease or at a, like a thing they couldn't control. And that's, um, that's different than a personal kind of injury where you know who you're at and you know what happened and there's there's somewhere to channel that and so I think we started to see there was some interest research um through astronauts actually that I was quoted in COVID days where at first you know people were just because astronauts are in you know they're isolated and they're in this they're basically in a pod and there's first there's like kind of an excitement then there starts to be some anxiety and depression and then there starts to be irritation and they start thinking you're you're mad at me or you're talking about and all this just by isolation alone what it does to kind of the human psyche and that research had nothing to do with the pandemic but yeah shows that we are not meant to be alone right uh find find your way out that maybe you're throwing a different net and have a different tribe after covid but yes. that, you know we really do need each other and that of course is such an important kind of spiritual and existential truth I agree completely with that, you know, and my follow-up question would be for you too, is, you know, being that we in, as a site and yes, you know, I could attach to COVID, but just in general, in life, a lot of us, I feel today, and I see it with people I know, I see it in family structures. I see it sometimes in, even in my own clientele, we're always in a state of survival. We're in survival mode all the time. And I feel like some of the work I'm doing with my clients currently is teaching them to come out of survival mode because it is trauma-based. It is, it is rooted to trauma, hands down. But how, in your opinion, how does one go from being in survival mode, so to speak, to thriving? Well, that's, because that's what I'm working with, with my clients currently. Yeah, that's right. Well, um, have your clients or you check out polyvagal theory and I, I won't go too much into it, but it's basically the idea. Um, and this is obviously biologically true that our nervous system um, is reacting to life. Um, for some of us, because of trauma, our nervous system developed in kind of a fight or flight state. It wasn't ever anything but surviving. Now, maybe there were good days where the fear was less and other days where the fear was more dynamics that affect that. And so um, it's actually beginning to think I have to change my nervous. I have to heal my nervous system. I have to groom my nervous system, which even when I went to school down 20 years ago, the, the research was not there. Talk right. therapy was helpful, but we didn't think we could change a brain like we understand now. And so the idea through mindfulness, through meditation, through processing old things, so they're not part of the pain body and held in the physical body, um, are actually then you kind of build a new brain or in a way build a new nervous system, but it takes time. It takes time. And I always liken it to um, like, what does your nervous system need for it to be in a relaxed, open, trusting, undefended, unprotected state? It needs to feel safe and it needs to feel connected which is the piece people don't. So I can't just take deep breaths, but then be really hard on myself and self-criticism because then I, my body's, you know, I'm getting, yes, I, muscles are relaxing, but I'm disconnected from myself. So that's not going to move me into thriving. That's going to keep me stuck in more of a fight or flight survival psyche. And so all this work around relationship to self that you're doing, that you did with yourself, that I'm doing actually is about changing the biology, which is phenomenal. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Especially that we have this new research out where we know we can do this. And you know what a lot of people don't understand, and I didn't understand it until I got into my own work and started doing what I'm doing currently. It's so fascinating that we have the power in our mindset to change, to physically heal our bodies with the power of our minds. Our minds are so, so powerful. And a lot of people don't understand that, that years ago, I mean, if you even go back into the Atlantean times and you read about these beautiful things, we were like superhumans. And I'll use, you know, Eric was super, yeah. like we had the power to 
heal our bodies with yeah. no medicine. It was all mine. It was well, all the mindset. Yeah. And my, yeah, which is different than the anxious mind. And that's the fork in the road. Right. And that's, right. that's what I need in my chapter freedom from the mind. It isn't a mind that doesn't organize or can't visualize things. It is the anxiety, the illusions, the projections, the, now it's conspiracy sometimes right. it is a mind gone amok basically but the power of the whole self exactly i um i'll tell you really quickly i went to turkey on this day tour and we did a couple of other turkish things um but we went to what's called an asclepion asclepion anyway a ruins of an old hospital it's like okay so the beginning and this is they know this from all the artifacts and all all the history stuff but there's a person at the at the head of the hospital so if I come to that hospital in that day and age if they couldn't heal me they wouldn't bring me in they would just be honest so there was this like you can come in if we can heal and so then if I was able to be healed I would start walking down an aisle and then when we were in the tour we were walking and there were there was holes in the ceiling above it's like so somebody said well what are those holes for it's like oh the physicians would whisper um, positive affirmations to the patients because that they knew that would heal them it's like oh well that's pretty cool and this is hundreds thousands of years ago don oh it gets better and then we went into where that hallway went and it's like there were these like cement bed well there weren't cement there were stone beds it's like what is this those are dreaming beds because they knew that the dreams were actually important to the illness that's Jungian therapy that's right. the subconscious the final right. one on the other side that we walked back through this corridor was this like theater it was like it's like yes because they knew laughter would heal so all the patients had performances and comedy there to help them laugh because they knew so positive affirmation dealing with the unconscious so it was like we have nothing new but it's this idea that these are innate properties within us right it isn't me healing you it's you coming in and us providing an environment that right. you know, we can heal from that place yeah I know it was That's awesome. fascinating. Yeah. that yeah. is fascinating and it just it's it just proves like how powerful we are because you know we're not the ones driving the boat you know the other person is we're guides we're there to educate and give them the tools but they need to implement those tools for themselves in order to heal in order to change the mindset we're not miracle workers like you it, it takes work it takes commitment but the outcome is so rewarding just yes. to be aware, to be awake, to understand truly what's going on, that everything is connected. And, and it does start here. It does, yeah. no matter what any, like, I don't care what anyone says, like, it starts with the mindset. It starts with showing up for yourself, what you think of yourself, because everything else then connects. Everything else lines. Well, and to, to be able to have people be, you know, empowered that there's, you know, not to not, not to neglect oneself in a physical medical way or psychotherapy way for sure, but that there's so much within us that is an indigenous kind of um, truth, but we've, we've really lost that in kind of Western medicine and conventional thinking. And so, um, you know, and even with COVID, I'm kind of in a weird way circling back, like people started to take care of themselves they couldn't get into the doctors easy it's like well what can i do so yeah right what what would you say for people that are currently struggling in their lives and they're trying to you know start at least turn the wheels put the wheels into motion so to speak where they're in survival mode currently but they're trying to shift that to where they are thriving, where, you know, even though they're facing challenges in their lives, how can they maintain that thriving mindset moving forward to then it becomes automatically a habit, so to speak? Yeah, well, um, and that's why in my book, I would have a, a topic, but then I would right away go to practice because all of this can be conceptual, which doesn't actually change a brain. I mean, we can think interesting thoughts, but to embody wakefulness, to to have integrated um 
transformation, sustained change, you have to put things into practice. So even though I'm not very much a CBT therapist, like cognitive behavioral therapy in terms of I go deeper, some of the practices are behavioral and they're about what what are we doing with our thoughts kind of thing. But getting to daily practice, I think is important. And a few just kind of core ones are in a relationship to self, that that's a, that's a daily um, connection. I have a, like a three minute thing I do every day with my first cup of coffee, my first sip of coffee. I just start in, I am with you and I am in this body and I am in this moment. So something about being present, but also a relational piece to that. Secondly, um, it's about processing emotions. It's not only about emotions, but boy, if you're not doing that, that sets such a course of everything that follows that. And a lot of times people, John, will feel something, but that they immediately think about it. Why am I feeling sad? Well, actually in that way, we've left the emotion. Emotions only last seconds, sometimes minutes, very brief waves of emotion. So my coaching is be present and with yourself. Make sure you actually are feeling emotions. Don't worry about if you understand them or not. And then that third piece is the mind, watch the projections. Um, And I think that begins to build a sense of connection and calm, which is restorative to the nervous system. We're not carrying any old trauma because we're processing old emotions and staying current with emotions. And we're not setting ourselves up for further anxiety and survivorship kind of mentality because we're not going to wherever the Pied Piper of our mind will take us. It's like, no, 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 no. I don't have to believe that thought. I do not have to tell that story. I do not know what's going to happen five minutes from now. It's ultimately a guess. Like really, we, our mind is an amazing, powerful thing, but that we need to be the masters. You know, we need to mind that store. So how does that land with you? Do those three no, things? I, I completely agree with that because it is, it is that quick shift. It's to recognize it. I almost picture it like leaves floating in the air, almost like mm-hmm. notice it, notice the thought because we're humans. We have to understand we are light beings in a human experience. And sometimes we can't help, but have what I call the critter brain, you know, Mm -hmm. those, those negative thoughts, you know, because we're human and we, we are emotional creatures. So, you know, sometimes, sometimes when you have a negative thought, notice it, I've pictured it like a leaf floating in the breeze, you know, like, okay, I've noticed it, but I'm not going to have it rooted to me. Notice it. Thank you for making me aware, but I've got this because it is, you know, all of a sudden it's that creepy creepiness of fear, It's like, it's like a trickster, you know, and it's trying to attach itself to something that's fear-based and it's up to us how much power we have to attach to that fear or notice it and say, you know what? Thank you. I recognize that you're here, but I've got this. I've got this. And not attached to it. And I, you probably heard the same, but don't own your thoughts and don't let them own you. And it really is. We, there used to be a kind of therapy that was about, they called it stop, um, stop your thoughts as if you could. So then people were super stressed out because they tried to stop their thoughts, but they couldn't, of course. So they were just, that was that much more mental activity, which is, Great. you know, uh, a road to insanity. Like the greater the that created probably more anxiety, that's and probably right. turned right. off parasympathetic system, so it right. shut down your digestive system, and now you're that's in right. a fight, flight, freeze response. And that's oh right. my god. Well, the other thing to think about to throw in, and uh, with your experience and who you bring on the show, I, I would guess your listeners have, you know, some a basis by which to kind of hear what I'll say next, which is parts work. It's another kind of approach in therapy. So when we not only don't go wherever that thought would have us go, number one, it might not be true. Um, it is just a thought and we can have a, a more core experience. But ultimately, Don, sometimes that thought is actually coming from a young and or injured part of us. So we have to have the wisdom to know, oh, well, if if I only just notice and then don't see where it's coming from, a deeper dive, not the thinking, but where's the thought coming from, 
that part, that's kind of how our younger injured parts of us throw that white flag up. It's like trying to get help through sometimes an awful thought or, or feeling or even kind of shame in a way. But shame is, we were shamed. Something needs to heal if we feel that. So I encourage people to, like you say, witness the thought, don't swallow it whole but also to be curious, where is this coming from? So then in parts work, once there's a core of Catherine, like a, a true other, uh, um, my core self that is whole and always has been whole, this other part, I can engage with that other part. And then, then it's more relational. I might say to that part, maybe it's my 14 year old. When my dad left, he said, I'm leaving you and your sister. That's why it was traumatic. Cause he actually said it was us. So I, the fracture to my sense of being good enough was prof- excuse me, was profound. So when I used to have those thoughts and, and again, love the therapists that work with me, I, no one was helping me with parts work. I didn't understand Mm. that was a young teenager that just didn't know the truth. She was confused about her worth. So instead of being mad at myself, because I'm trying to like myself and why do I think I'm not good enough? Then it was more like, Oh, sweetie, I know you're good enough. Maybe you don't know you're good enough, but I know, I know we're good enough. So you just, I'm just going to hold you. And I didn't even need that to change. Although it did change those young injured parts of us do heal when it was kind of like bringing children into your inner world. Like, come on, we're in our child work. (laughs) Right. I'm huge on that. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And I would often have my clients, especially when I'm working with them with inner child work, because once I know, like, obviously trauma comes up, you know, and I don't like to attach to the trauma too much because that's not my specialty and nor will I ever claim to have a degree in that whatsoever. I obviously work with the aftermath of building new belief systems, but I almost encourage them privately to write a letter to yeah. that self, to yeah. that age where the trauma happened and forget giving the fact because there has to be a level of forgiveness of you know you only knew what you knew at that age you weren't expected to have the answers especially being in that environment as a young innocent child so forgive yourself at that in go to that moment write a letter of what that inner child needed from your adult self and then reverse it. Yeah. And have the child reverse it and have the child write to the new you. And I don't ask to like, because that's a personal thing and that's, but I felt, you know, and honestly it's because it was asked of me and I knew how much it worked for me. And I offered it as a, as a suggestion when I work with clients of, you know, attached to that inner child and forgive that inner child, because you don't know what you don't know. Well, and and once you know what you know, then you can take the necessary action to mend those wounds. Mend the wounds. Or like I say, it even just settles because that kid of course they don't trust. Right. And, and we can trust and they're learning to trust kind of thing. There's a patience that comes with that. But another thing to click on, of course, if you're talking to your audience about relationships is unmet childhood needs. Usually we hit our adulthood and then pivot toward our adults or, or even our own children to get unmet childhood needs met. And that sets everybody up. So if I don't know, I'm lovable, you're my best friend. I need you to always want to have lunch with me. You can't ever really have a boundary because I will interpret that as I am unlikable or unlovable. And really that was just a part of me that needed to heal. And um, it's so helpful for people to get off that merry-go-round of needing validation from their external world, from their partner, from their job, from their culture, from wherever, again, even their children. And so it, it, this kind of healing is really everybody's freedom that we love, not just our own freedom. And then we can love in actually a clean way. We love because we love, not because we need to know if we're lovable or not. Yeah. Right. And it yeah. does, it, I really feel, you know, it always starts with the root of childhood. I really, there's a commonality that I see in my life, in my clients' lives, in people I talk to, other specialists that come on to the show, of all occupations, you know, it does stem from childhood because, 
you know, and even looking back, it, it does go generational. I truly, truly feel that because it's what their parents taught them and what mm -hmm. their parents' parents taught them. And it's this belief system that's passed down generation through generation. And even in pregnancy, those carry into in utero, and I know that a child, a baby in utero can experience that fight flight because they're in their mother's womb. So if the mother is experiencing these things and she's going through trauma herself, that is being passed on to the baby. And the baby is developing that way already in that survival mode that we spoke about from the beginning of the podcast. Yeah. yeah. So it's not even when the baby's born and how healthy is the home environment. Yeah. The epigenetic stuff is going to be exploding. I think of understanding not just DNA as we've understood it, but cortisol levels and the, the nervous system. So generational anxiety, um, and in that way, generational trauma potentially at the, at a very physical level and people don't understand like, why am I anxious? Because I have a good life. They don't understand. And again, can circle back and give themselves a hard time. So this can be so helpful, um, to then having the power of like, I'm not just changing me and future generation, you know, I'm changing future generations potentially. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so huge. And oh my gosh. No, this is so cool. I'd love, you know, my last question would be for you. What was your big aha moment? Like, what was your wake up call, so to speak? What was that one moment in your life where you're like, whoa, okay, like, I'm done with this way of believing. I'm done with this way of thinking. I need to now go to my core self, my Catherine self. What was your big wake up call for you? Oh gosh. Um, well, actually at six, I'll have, I'll share a couple at 16 when you're in a hospital and uh, you fail a suicide attempt, it doesn't get lower than that in a certain way, honestly, you know, I was so, but it, I had a friendly conversation with God in the, you know, Roseburg, Oregon, <laughs> you know, Mercy hospital. It's like, okay. So I didn't do that right either. All right. So we're going to do something different. And it was the launch. It took me many years to heal my body and my trauma and certain relationships, but that was a, a life-changing moment. And so at the, I don't think, I don't know if I told you this when we did our pre-conversation, but my mom, having known I was kind of in harm's way, I thought I was taking dangerous narcotics. What she had done was take all the dangerous drugs out of the house and there were only antibiotics. So the funny joke is I rarely get sick. And I think I just, I think I just had a big major dose at 16 years old and it's uh, served me all the way. But anyway, that moment. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, Having be, I didn't know I want to be a mom. I married a man with four children, having two child, children naturally, one of which I got to bring out of my own, excuse my my own body in a just, a, just a life changing kind of way. Just because this midwife is like, you want to pull her out? I'm like, what? <laughs> like, oh my god. Um, and then lastly, just a moment spiritually, I was in a meditation state. I was actually in some pretty deep pain, and I never had trauma, like in, in being in touch with that raw, raw, as we are speaking of, have a spiritual experience and a spiritual teacher came in who had died. I was in the morning. There were no drugs and alcohol involved. This was light of day, clean and sober. And it was like, oh, uh, the, the profound experience of the love within me, um, much beyond even my human self, the light, as you call it. Um, you know, those are three experiences that, um, it, you know, were, I was kind of blasted into another universe and they all have had a part of then, like you say, I'm done with the old, like I have to live from a really different paradigm and I live part-time in Costa Rica. Now I'm able to be able to, um, live a different part of my core values. I didn't think that I didn't even have that on the radar. So that's really beautiful to commit to this planet. You know, that's kind of next for me. Uh, so, yeah, oh, I love that. No, I love that. And, you know, I, I truly feel that, you know, the work that both you do and I do and others that come on and, and there's so many people 
you know, we're always taught, you know, you know, there's bad people. We're always, even if you, you look at the news, you know, there's so much focus on the negative of this world. And there is, I'm not going to dismiss it and say, there's not a lot of crap going on in this world. We have war already going on Israel. I mean, it, it's just insane. But at the end of the day, there are truly good people in this world that that really rose from the ashes, so to speak, that turn their traumas into triumphs and that led them down different paths of their lives that it was like. If I even look back on my own life and I was like, man, you know, if I didn't go through half the crap I went through in my life, I wouldn't be here doing what I love doing. I have this passion in my soul that I feel when I get to help people and that I get to help educate people what way that looks like, whether I'm coaching, whether I'm doing the podcast, it's such a beautiful yeah. thing for me to experience because I know it aligns with what I'm trying to do but had I not gone through all the things that I gone through in my life I would never be in the place where I am and I only now manifest and have this thought of wow where will it take me next mm -hmm. Uh, you know, um, where will this take me next? I'm about to publish a book myself. It's going to be out in a couple of months before Christmas. And I wrote a book called Radiant You. And it's an affirmation book for girls. Because uh, uh, I didn't have that as a child. And I, I was like, you know what? I want to create something from my own childhood experiences, from when I was a young girl, from when I was a teenager. It would needed to hear yes. growing up and it's just so fulfilling that like I could be like well oh, now I'm going to be a published author on top of it and I'm you know embracing that and I'm working on my own manifest and I don't whenever that comes out that's that's a rewrite that's like a rewrite you know? yeah, yeah 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 but it's like all these doors are opening up for me and it's like my gosh like it makes me appreciate even more the gifts that I learned and the tools that I learned and to be able to share it with others. It's just beauty full circle. It really is a 160 mm -hmm. that not only were we able to change our mindsets and say, you know what, we deserve better. We want to grow. We want to heal. We want to learn the core beliefs and change those things and change everything that we weren't happy with with ourselves, but now we get to educate others and give back and help enlighten this world because no matter what, at the end of the day, I truly feel that light and good will always win. It Ab will always win. Absolutely. And I don't care how much negativity is out in the world. Yeah. I don't care. It, you know, everything is fear-based. I don't, that's why I don't watch the news anymore. That's why I don't listen to anything negative. I don't watch anything. I, I don't want to even plant that stuff in my mind. I want positive. I want healthy. And this way it keeps me grounded yeah. where now I have that mindset to have uh, my cup overfill okay. and help others. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I would go as far as to say there is unconsciousness. It's like the shadow of life. And there's always consciousness that meets unconsciousness. And sometimes it's a matter of just waiting. And that doesn't say child abuse is okay. War is okay. Um, like all of it, like it is unconscious. Um, and so it really is an and 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 I think the good fight right now, whether it's about your relationship to the media or whether it's about, you know, um, how you do social action is to do those things, make your contributions from a place of clarity, a place of love and a place of resilience and not out of fear and not out of our own um kind of unconsciousness towards other people so well dawn thank you so much for having me and the work oh you're my doing. gosh the pleasure is mine i and honestly um i will have all your stuff in the description box for people that want to get a hold of you but for those that are listening what is the best way to get a hold of you catherine if someone wants to reach out to talk to you or to book a session with you um, well, a good way would just be to go to my website, um, Harbor Glow Holistic, 
um, dot com. And that has publishing. It has my counseling um, stuff on there. And it has my husband's a, a life coach. So he's on there too. He's also a chiropractor. So we're trying to do a number of different things. Um, if they're not in Oregon, I can't see them because I my jurisdiction is just Oregon, but they could certainly buy a book or they could come to a retreat or, um, you know, uh, find a way to connect one way or another. I have a newsletter I do if they want every three months that I just kind of talk about these kinds of things so that, again, just kind of everybody holding hands and we're all, all in this together, you know, and doing right. the so thank you for that. Um, oh my promoting. gosh, thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so, so much. And guys, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this episode. Like I said before, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, share, like, share with people that you think could benefit from this video. And thank you so much for being with me and I will see you on the next episode. Thanks guys. Be well.